What is up? Welcome to Etsy Jam, episode number 65. Are you or do you know a vintage or one-of-a-kind seller on Etsy? Feeling a little forgotten by Etsy's last round of sales? Leaders in the Etsy space and online seller groups? Well, boy, do we have an episode that is tailor-made just for you. Tara Jacobson from Marketing Artfully joins us today to cover everything you need to know about vintage and one-of-a-kind SEO. Tara is a true leader in the SEO space. She's joined us before on the podcast, and we are super excited to have her back today to focus on vintage SEO. What is up? Welcome to Etsy Jam, the show where we have spiffy conversations about serious topics. I am Gordon from Marmalade. I am Richie from Marmalade, and if you don't yet know about Marmalade, Marmalade is the best Etsy SEO and market research tool for serious sellers. So if you have a Etsy shop that you are serious about, whether it be handmade or vintage, you should go check out Slade at Marmalade.com, M-A-R-M-A-L-E-A-D.com. And we have a very special guest with us today. We have Tara Jacobson from Marketing Artfully. Uh, you might remember Tara from being on the show once before. Uh, you might already know her from her website, Marketing Artfully, where she helps a bunch of people with SEO advice and marketing advice, too. Uh, she's a total guru in the space, so we're super glad to have you with us again, Tara. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely, and we're talking vintage today, like all vintage SEO all the time. Yeah, I'm excited for that. It's awesome. Uh, and to, to clue you guys in, too, Tara just posted on her own blog, marketingarfully.com. If you go there, there's a link in the top to her blog, and you can find her post that she just made titled SEO for Vintage and One-of-A-Kind Etsy Sellers. Uh, we had kind of chatted before about how, you know, vintage wasn't always getting as much love in the space, uh, in the Etsy space, uh, as far as, you know, finding out about how to set your stuff up and getting noticed on Etsy and during sales and things like that. Uh, and so we thought it'd be really relevant to have a conversation with you specifically for vintage and one of a kind sellers. Absolutely. So if they go to marketingartfully.com forward slash vintage, vintage SEO, it'll take them right to there. Oh, look um, at that. Fancy. Right? I was like, oh my gosh, I better make it easy. Um, <laughs> so what I talk about in there is let's just back up a step and say why it's hard to do SEO for vintage. Like, I would love to sell greeting cards. There was a lady on this weekend in your forums on Facebook that was like, I sell greeting cards and I am doing outdoors ones. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that would be so easy. So then you establish yourself with greeting cards or you know, uh, any kind of cards and then you have your specific items and you really massage that one listing or maybe a couple of listings and you can spend a ton of time doing that. And I will tell you that I have I, I have 400 and some odd listings and I'm pushing for 500 by the time Christmas comes. And I cannot physically do that if I'm spending an hour or two to do each one. It's just not like the time doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. yeah. And so what I looked at is how can we kind of lift our stores and then lift our categories and then lift our items using SEO. So I broke it up into classes first. So that's our first very top little kind of thing. And those are gonna be like home and living or lamps and lighting. So I'm gonna give you a really good example about lamps and lighting because I just did this yesterday. I have a an amazing, oh, it's over there, it's hard to see. It's like this old slag cherub lamp that's all gaudy and ornate and it's amazing. But so that class is under lamps and lighting. And what you do is you go into Etsy, you do a search, you type in lamp, and you'll see a bunch of examples. And then you find out that kind of the categories, it's almost the categories, right? Category, lamp, and lighting. So that means I want to have a lot of those items and a lot of those keywords in my title at the very end right? Because that's the least important thing to Etsy. They think the front part's really important, then the middle part, and then the very end is important. So that's going to be my class. So does that make sense? Like your very highest level kind of, uh, you could do bathroom, you could do kitchen, you could do any of those things 
and you're kind of hitting that class and you're going to put those in as many items as you can as keywords in your shop and we're going to talk more about that later and then the next thing is what kind of lamp is it so it happens to be a desk lamp it could be a table lamp so there's two really strong keywords that i can use mm -hmm. and that's what i'm going with so mm -hmm. i have cherub desk lamp angel desk lamp metal slag desk lamp something like that and what i watch a lot of vintage sellers on the facebook group do is they get really confused about well should i have vintage we're going to talk about vintage the keyword too but they're going to say vintage metal desk lamp vintage metal office lamp vintage metal you know and they're asking should i have these exact match keywords the whole way through and you just don't have to have that what you want to have is kind of pick one or two really main keywords for that item so i think i picked um it's cast metal so i picked cast metal cherub lamp and then i picked metal De ornate metal desk lamp right and so those are my main keywords and then everything else kind of goes at the end so does that make sense as you're looking at a vintage one-of-a-kind item how you could sort of for your shop and so then i have other lighting i have oil lamps and so i would have oil lamp uh forearm italian i think it's whale something oil lamp but at the end of it, I would have all kinds of lamps, lighting, all of those. And what the cumulative effect of having a bunch of different lighting options in my store is I can then start to rank my store for those long-term keywords, long-term mm -hmm. keywords. Does that make so do sense? You, do you typically use the word vintage anywhere in your title or your tags? Okay. So I have this. So first off, if you do a search in... Um, Etsy for vintage metal lamp. Okay. They're actually going to show you an item that says, do you want to uh, show the filtered results? And what they do is they filter it by those date attributes we put in, right? It says, do you want to look at the filtered results or do you want to look in all the items? And my guess is because I don't see vintage in my keywords anywhere in my back end stats keywords is a lot of people have to say, yeah, just show me the vintage stuff. Like right. you're making a big deal out of it. We're making a big deal out of it, but they aren't. They're just like, yeah, show me the vintage items. Mm -hmm. If you do a search for metal desk lamps, even now we're going to talk about this a wee bit, but there's a little vintage. Do you want to see the vintage metal desk lamps if you do lots of vintage searches? That's part of what you guys are going to be able to explain a little bit better as we talk, that everybody's search results aren't exactly the same because of the dynamic nature of search. But so that's that's you would never have to use vintage if you didn't want to in Etsy. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you want it to show up in Google. As a keyword, you have to use it in your title. But you don't have to use it. Using it three times or four times isn't going to increase the relevancy in Google. My very last one might be vintage lamps lighting, right? And Google's going to pick up on that, that that's a vintage item. Does that make sense? Yep. So, so what happens a lot of times is people ask, do I have to use vintage? If you're only worrying about the Etsy environment, then no. But I would use it at least once. I tend to use antique if I can, and I'm not exactly sure I know that there's a certain amount of time. I only really use antique on, um, like that lamp is an antique. It's got the claw foot feet and it's lion's foot feet and it's like it's amazing um and it's three hundred dollars or something like that with shipping on my other stuff vintage tends to be a much more highly searched keyword which i found out using marmalade than antique is antique people aren't necessarily looking as much for antiques mm -hmm. as they are looking for vintage on etsy i don't know why 
Gotcha. Okay. So that is what's cool. I don't know if anybody noticed or if they saw it because Etsy kind of messes around with things, but they did put the attri attributes back that are kind of, and this may not be one, but Hollywood vintage, Baroque, um, all of those. And those attributes tend to really help us. Uh, uh, modern, mid-century modern, those kinds of things. And if we can get those in the attributes, that leads to another question. If we have mid-century modern as one of the attributes, should you put it in your title if it's really glaringly mid-century modern? And I, I do mm -hmm. because of So that's exciting. Yeah. All right. So when we were chit-chatting, I told you that the vintage people are a wee bit PO'd at Etsy because the the big push and all these new things, they weren't including vintage as much in it. And I know that some of the gals got together and they kind of spent a lot of time on the Etsy forums uh, talking, you know, saying we want a place at the table. This is supposed to be, you know, something that's there. Well, I think it might have worked because they did send out a newsletter last week that, that was Throwback Thursday, and it was called a Vintage Home Decor Newsletter. Mm -hmm. And that was very cool. Like, everybody was really happy. I'm really happy that they're doing that, because that gives us an opportunity to have our things highlighted, too. Yep. And so what you want to do when you get those newsletters is you want to look at them for keywords. So they had sections of the newsletter that were vintage velvet furniture. I did not know that velvet furniture was a thing, but it's a thing. It's something. They spend a lot of time and money and split testing and effort to figure out in that newsletter what's going to generate the most sales. So we want to really acknowledge that and, and take clues from that. So they had vintage rugs, vintage canisters. Anybody who sells vintage knows that canisters fly off the shelves. And then they had this really cool category called blush glassware. And it was pink glass. And I was like, oh, my gosh, blush. I didn't know that's what it was called. And I don't sell glass. I tend to sell a lot of heavy metal things. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a really nerdy suggestion. If you click on that link, right, and then it goes to a web page, yeah. and you look in the top address bar, it will tell you what the actual search was. And yeah. the actual search was pink glass. Ah, okay. Ah. So you, in that case, you may think, oh, I should put blush glass in there. Yeah. But you don't want to. You would have missed out on that search if you didn't have pink glass in there. Yeah, that's a neat trick. Super nerdy, I know, right? <laughs> um, and and this is what's cool. If you guys are on the, uh, if you go to the, the Marmalade Facebook page, Tracy's there, Tracy G. And she had two listings on first pages of those click-throughs for her items. She crushed it. Yeah. So think about the exposure that she got as the entire email database for Etsy got Throwback Thursday and the amount of traffic she probably got for being on those first pages of Etsy. Yep. Very proud of her. <laughs> so does all of that make sense to you guys? I know that you're not as familiar with vintage, um, and I know you get lots of questions about it, and part of it is that it's, it's one of a kind, right? Like we're selling one thing every single time. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> no questions. Not yet. I have, I have more to talk about. Don't you worry. Oh, I'm sure we'll have questions. <laughs> okay. So the best way to do research. So now you kind of know sort of what I think you should do. I think, and, and some of the girls have been doing that. And they have been showing up on high-level category pages where they never did. Okay? not ca I say category pages, but not the actual category pages anymore. But high-level pages. They've been showing yeah. up for, in my case, lamps. They've been showing up for um, 
bathroom mirrors, things that they weren't able to get before because they had a number of listings that had those in them and all the little boats rose. And so their store rose higher for those keywords. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So, so now let's talk about like how to do this stuff. Look at okay. me not swearing. Um, okay. So the, <laughs> so the first thing you want to do is you want to use Etsy and do basic research. So you're going to go into the top and you're going to type, um, like I have a little mirror, a bathroom mirror. Okay. So you're going to type bathroom. And it's funny, another gal who's really knowledgeable about Etsy and I really were pounding the bathroom vanity keyword. We were like, oh, this is vanity stuff. This is bathroom vanity. Come uh -huh. to find out there's nothing there. Like people aren't searching for bathroom vanity. We had just got into the habit of that. So uh -huh. what you want to do is you want to go up in the top and do a search. And much like Pinterest does now in Etsy, when you do a search, It'll give you clues. It'll tell you right across the top what those things are. So when I went and did a search, if you do glassware, it'll say pink glassware, um, green glassware, depression glassware. I think it said some things up there, especially if you put that vintage keyword in. Yeah, so and this those, is different than the, the search bar autocomplete, right? This is on your results page you're talking. Yeah, so I like the search bar autocomplete. Like, that's going to give you your very first clue to what you should do. That's your very first thing you should look at. But then when you pick one, when you're like, okay, I'm going to pick pink glass, and you click pink glass, then there's little boxes just like there are in Pinterest along the underneath. You need to be writing all these things down. And what I did was I just made a spreadsheet so that I don't have to keep recreating all the bathroom things and all the kitchen things and all the wall hanging things. I know all those tail ends that I'm trying to get my site to my my Etsy site to rank for. And then I can go in and fill just the front ends of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then once you have that kind of, I would say, maybe five really good strong keywords that you think your item might be, then I go into Marmalade, right? And I get, and I check. And I used this example with you guys the last time because it got more shocking since then. I'm from Northern Pennsylvania, and we call the things around light switches, switch plate covers. That's what they are. And I swear, I was doing my work, and and I literally, there were no other words for it. I'm like, what would it be? And it has low engagement, and it has 112,000 views per month. And that's everything. That's not just vintage. That's every person that is searching for switch plate covers. And using, I used the storm, and I used the search, and it said that um, light switch covers has moderate engagement, which is quite better. And um, 476,000 views, which is 364,000 views more than switch plate covers. And literally, there's no way for me to tell that in Etsy, right? Like, you can find seed keywords. You can figure out how to best position yourself in Etsy's ecosystem, but then to find out that that your strongly held belief in what things are called is wrong, you have to do that search either in Etsy, in Marmalade, or I guess you could go look at them, but I don't know how you would find the views. Yeah, so they don't anyway. share that, yeah. Yeah, I don't think they share that. Um, so that is, that is super important, that whole figuring out those first seed keywords, and then going in and really checking them. Now, do you guys talk to your peeps about the long tail versus, like, big tail keywords? I guess they're we, short keywords. We do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll yeah. Call them, like, long tail and then, like, broad keywords, yeah. Yeah, so I think from from reading a bunch of the comments, a lot of the people are getting super frustrated. They're like, I hear this from this person, and I go in and I change all my keywords. 
And then I hear this from this person and I go in and change all my keywords. Okay, so first off, stop doing that. Go in, <laughs> change a listing, and then see if it helps. Like, I've been working with this gal, and she's super sweet, and I was telling you, she emails me every day. She's super nice. She has a question, a very short question. And um, she sold her first thing. She was so excited. Today, she emailed and said, I sold my first thing. And she had been working on, she was doing that. She was doing the you know, Renee Christine said to do this and I changed everything because she does handmade and one of a kind. And then Tara said to do this and I changed everything. So what you want to do is you want to understand that our one of a kind items have a very low chance of ranking for desk lamp, right? Like somebody who sells a handmade item that could literally say I have a thousand of these and just keep renewing that same listing is always going to have a better chance of showing up than us with even it's it's an amazing cherub I mean like gosh you would really want to have it in your home based on your decor um, but but I can't do enough SEO work to make it rank and beat somebody who has sold 2,000 desk lamps prior to me and whose store sells desk lamps when I have one. To yeah, sell. that's a great point. So a couple things we want to do as vintage sellers. Number one, you need to start looking for your, your one of a kind. So I have my stuff and then I have my one-offs, right? Like I have a, um, a, a, a no, flamingo, flamingo, a flamingo box. You would think like they would be really popular, but I only have one. And so that's not something I really try to like. I am trying to sell that one. But on that listing, I would be more so trying to sell kitschy boxes or, you know, 1960s boxes or retro boxes mm -hmm. more so than trying to sell this one item. So I'm thinking of my store as a whole and knowing that I do have a lot of storage. I have a lot of organization. That is definitely a bathroom box, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you would want to start thinking about using your one-of-a-kind items in a way that's going to lift your whole store for certain categories of keywords. And those a lot of times are your categories, right? Like I have vintage kitchen. I have vintage bathroom. I have. I don't have lighting. I put that in my home decor one. And so unless I was really going to go get excited about shipping giant heavy lamps, you know, it's just going to have to stay in home decor right now. So you, as a vintage seller, you will get stuff. But when you're sourcing, we have the option to source whatever we want. So if you are finding that you literally never sell the same thing, Maybe you should try to source more things that are similar. Like I buy almost every um, doorstop that I that I run across. I buy them at antiques at antique stores. I buy them at auctions. When I'm at estate sales, I always find them because nobody else is looking down, and I'm always looking like by the doors. Do they have doorstops? And so you can get your reticular activator going. Your fancy word. Um, but to start noticing the same kind of things, because say you have 300 bucks to go shopping this month or this week, God bless you, um, but you had $300 to go sourcing, you have a choice about what you buy, right? Like you could, rather than buying a whole bunch of different bric-a-brac and, you know, tchotchkes and stuff like that, unless, oh my gosh, there's the cutest store, it's like, it's it's a cute overload or cute something, and all she has is cute tchotchkes, right? Then, then that's a really good thing to do. But in general, you should try to have your store be more cohesive, even as a vintage seller. Mm -hmm. And that will help. And that will help your long tail. So the, the, the tall one is if we could rank for lighting. And then the long tail is, can I rank for the lady who wants to find a really gaudy, ornate, heavy, marble-based cherub lamp, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that lady's way down here. 
but I want my whole store to rank for lighting. Yeah, I would imagine that would even help with um, SEO in general because as a one-of-a-kind seller, how we are saying before, you kind of have to do this repeatedly. You have to do it for every single item. So the more things that you have that you have the same thing repeated throughout your shop, the less work you have to do on reinventing the SEO for every single one of those. Yeah, I mean, that can save you just time in itself. Um, if I'm doing an ephemeral listing and it's a picture, like I just sold one. There's a place called Willettston, North Dakota. Who knew? Um, and I sold a picture <laughs> that I shipped to there because somebody from there bought it, right? So he bought it on that one so long tail keyword. I mean, there have to be like 12 people in that town. <laughs> so every other piece of that title should be trying to help. Like I did have, it was a wedding picture. So I had bride, I had groom, I had wedding fashion. I think a bunch of them are from the 1920s. So I had had that kind of at the front, right? And then at the end, I had vintage ephemera, you know, really just keywords that were going to help all of my ephemera pieces rank. And anybody who's sold on Etsy for any time knows that whether they say it or not, Etsy rewards you for that. That's like when you sell, I gave us an example in that blog post, you'll, you'll have a bunch of different stuff in your, in your store, but you sell a blue jean jacket, a vintage blue jean jacket, and five minutes later, you sell another one. It's yeah. not like there were two people sitting there that were like, I'm going to poke the button right at the same time. It's that Etsy has weighted your value as a jean jacket seller higher for a little bit while you sold that item. Mm -hmm. And it even works with studio. Um, I tend to sell, I have issues because I have all these old tools that I use when I do my artsy stuff. And so I find them and I sell them. And uh, so I've been selling quite a few tools through Studio. Or if you're doing ephemera, you could, I think you can get that into the Studio part of it. And then what will happen is I'll sell two paint scrapers in the same day. Or I'll sell a paint scraper and a screwdriver. And it's because Studios recognize that I've sold one of those. And they're like, oh, she sells tools. And then you get a little bit more of a boost for that. So, so that's interesting. So when you have um, a more broad keyword... Uh, that you're using in your title then do you like do you care if you're ranking for that do you bother to check to see if you're ranking for that or you, do you just use that to kind of boost your credit for that keyword when you get a sale from perhaps another keyword exactly i don't think that i am going to rank for um uh this is a wallpaper roller yeah. right um it's not a great example because i don't know that very many handmade sellers are selling wallpaper rollers but I'm not actually trying to rank for even almost vintage tools, right? It'd be mm -hmm. great if I made it to page one, but I wouldn't want to go on page one for a 12 or $17 tool I'm selling. I would love my lamp to rank for that. I'm trying to look around. Oh, I have a brownie camera in a box that's like a whole thing that's worth a little bit. I have a mohair bear that's $200. There are certain things that I would really like to get exposure for those high-end ones. Um, and if you have a very small number of items in your store, then maybe you would try. But I don't think you can do it. I don't think you can have um, 10 items in your store and rank well in Etsy search. I think as handmade sellers, they can do collections and have email lists and you know, do all that and generate buzz for that. But as vintage sellers, if you only have 10 items, you're going to struggle to show up in search. Now, my girlfriend, who's an eBay seller, I make her list stuff on Etsy every now and then. And she listed a lamp, came down to my house, bought a lamp. I would have bought it because, you know, I like lamps. Bought a lamp, put it on Etsy. She had one item in her store. She sold that lamp because it was a very specific federal style, two candlestick. Like somebody was looking to outfit a lawyer's office. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm sure in that case, the person was searching 400. You know, she would have gone through all 400 pages of searches if she had to. Um, <laughs> yeah, but but if you're trying honestly to rank for salt and pepper shaker, that's a big deal in my world. I got salt and pepper shakers. It's not <laughs> like it's really hard to do. And if you're spending so much time on one listing trying to rank for such a hard term you're losing all that other time where maybe you could have listed you know five other items um so another thing that that is just brilliant and i don't know if this is industry like etsy wide or not but they've started I don't know if you would call it clumping or unclumping items. Um, so you, is it clumping? Is it unclumping? We say where declumping, the, where they spread them out. Yeah. Where they, they were spreading them out to where you could yeah. only have one item on each page. Right. Well, I have seen screenshots yeah. where there were two or three of the same shop yeah. on the same page. I've now, heard the, legends. <laughs> no, I've seen pictures from reputable sources. I get all kinds of backdoor intel. Um, <laughs> but so, so I think that that that's happening. I I know that there was a page going around that has um, all of the tests that Etsy's doing. So, first off, take a peek at that and see what the results are. So some of the results of things that they're doing have benefited vintage sellers, okay? And number two, I watch people in groups, not so much yours. Yours is a pretty, like, non-hysterical, nerdy group. Um, but I see people in groups that are like, they're doing this test and it's ruining my life. And now they hid the shipping amount or now they hid my... They put my reviews there, and I had a bad review, and now, you know, watch the testing, because I guarantee you the only thing that Etsy is trying to accomplish with their testing is to sell more. They're not trying to hurt, hurt us. They're not trying. They're not nefarious. They're not. They're just trying to do a test, and anytime they do a test, I kind of put my ears up, and I'm like, why are they testing this? Is this something that I should do? I put, um, I started doing it in my um, digital shop because I can keep my listings up for longer, obviously. But I have reviews in there um, as pictures so people can see those reviews because obviously having the reviews increase yeah. the conversion rate for sales. Sure. <laughs> we haven't mentioned your your um, printable shop yet, but that's Paperly People. Paperly People, yeah. For people that and want to check really, it out. It really is different. Like, it's night and day different between having a product that you can, you know, really tweak and really massage and is this keyword working and you can, you can look at it over time and is it better to have planner or is it better to have agenda because people in Europe like agendas and yeah. you know all those things those are really things that you can do when you have a long term product mm -hmm. but when you have a product like ours that's one of a kind it's just not worth the time it's worth it to find out for those big areas of your shop but it's not worth it for each individual item like I have a I have a brass cow on a stick like, there's only so much research I should do to figure that out. So I think that that's, um, like, that is a really cool thing with, with having long-term stuff that we just don't have as vintage sellers. There's not a, there's not a correlation with that. We can't say, oh, you know, I have this. And, and I have had it occasionally. I bought a giant bowl of, um, chandelier crystals and it was amazing like they were so good and I got so much traffic for them and it was wonderful but the chances of finding those things that you have exactly the same thing aren't good but you could find you know vintage postcards vintage ephemera vintage 
um, oil lamps, vintage, and then really start, I think they credit your store. I think they, I don't know this for a hundred percent fact, but that lady who sold a jean jacket, what I think happens is they say, oh, this is a good store. She's had good reviews. She has a good shipping time. She sold a jean jacket. Somebody else is looking for jean jackets. Let's slide this one in here because she just sold that one. Um, so they don't say they do that, but it's kind of, I've been doing Google since, well, before Google, I've been doing S real SEO since 2001. And lots of times you can sort of figure out what they're doing. Um, and I think that's one of the things that Etsy does is they think I'm good at selling old tools because everybody gives me good reviews. They like them. They're, they sell relatively well. In fact, I was just talking to somebody online. One of my next blog posts is going to be um, about should you should you like try to keep high and low end products in your store, thinking that the low end ones are going to um, you know help keep your sales up, keep the algorithm thinking that you're cool, and then you know, not have the old one or not have just high end ones, but I have to do some research. Mm -hmm. now, so now you mentioned um, you came from a Google SEO background and even before when you were talking about using the keyword vintage and saying how, you know, it might not really help you that much on Etsy, but I might put it on a listing just for the sake of Google for ranking on Google for something like that. When you're working on your SEO for one of your Etsy listings, typically like how do you weigh that? How much time or energy do you put thinking into the, the Google aspect of the SEO and whether those keywords would perform well on Google versus um, Etsy's SEO? So what you want to do is you want to look at the types of items that you sell and then you want to do a search on Google, right? You can start to figure these things out your own self. And because vintage is so custom, you want to try to figure out how you can get your items to show up in Etsy. So in, in uh, Google search. So I am never going to show up in Google shopping for wallpaper roller, right? There's a thousand places that sell like, let's talk home Depot Lowe's. They can buy a lot cheaper wallpaper roller. That's going to function better than my 30 year old one. Now, if they get to vintage, right, like if they're looking for a vintage scraper or they're looking for vintage whatever, then you could do a search on Google incognito. So all you have to do, just look up on the Google, how do I use an incognito browser? And you would want to go to Google and then do a search and see if your items come up. And they're not necessarily going to be in the general results tab. They're going to be in the shopping tab. Now, the really nice thing is that a lot of Etsy searches come up in the shopping tab, right? Like we can't, you can't pay to be in the shopping tab as a result, but Etsy is obviously working very well with Google right now and eBay must not be working well with them because not a lot of eBay searches come up, not a lot of eBay results come up. But what you need to find out is Go ahead and look at those Etsy listings that are coming up and see what characteristics they share. Do they all say vintage metal lamp? Like, but the hard part with, with Google search is what do they say? Like 20% of all searches, or maybe it's more than that, of all searches done every day have never been searched. So you don't know if you're going to be able to rank for, you know, metal, slag, lamp, cherub, head, you know, you don't know if that's going to do, but, but your best bet as an Etsy seller is to actually go to Google and start doing those searches. See if any, you know, if any come out, because I found in sometimes I'll do vintage. Um, what did I do? I did something vintage linens. I think I did it for one of these, these things. I did vintage linens and literally every result in Google shopping was vintage style from Wayfair, from Target, from all those. And so if you know you have no chance of ranking in Google, 
then you may want to say, oh, okay, well, then I'm either going to try to get something longer, authentic vintage, real vintage, something like that, or I'm going to seed the field on these ones and try to get on other ones. But you'll, you'll never know that without looking at Google yourself. Mm-hmm. People always ask this, should you SEO your items for Google or Etsy, right? So say I was going to try to SEO this vintage tablecloth, this one I have, this amazing vintage tablecloth so it would show up on on, uh, Google, and I did everything right, right? I did absolutely everything right. I had a nice big long description. I had it in the first part of the the description, which which Google does use. I, I made links to it outbound, you know, outside links to it from social media and my website. I did everything. And if they're only showing fake vintage tablecloths, it doesn't matter if I do all that. So I feel like if I'm selling on if I'm selling my vintage on Etsy, I need to try to rank well for the Etsy search. If I'm selling on eBay, I need to try to rank well for eBay search. I don't sell on Ruby Lane. I don't know anything about it, but I know that there's common practices for how to rank well on Ruby Lane that are different than how you would do on Etsy. Mm -hmm. So I think it's whichever, whichever ecosystem you're trying to rank in, because think about it. Tracy, they sent out a newsletter to the entire database, and because Tracy had done a really good job on her Etsy search, she ranked on two of the pages on the number one page of two of the searches. That's amazing. That is something that you can aspire to. And the other half of it is if you're watching the Marmalade show, you are so far out ahead of 90% of the other Etsy sellers. Most people, we start feeling like everybody's doing SEO And I work with a lot of people and a lot of people come to my website and I spend a lot of time on Etsy looking around, not like they buy my stuff. And so I go look at their shops. I do speaking events. I go look at their shops. Most of them are not doing any SEO. Like they have three arm lamp. And so you're going to beat them every time. Did that help answer your question? A lot of people, you know, once you start learning something, the audience you start to compare yourself against is a higher and higher caliber of audience, like a more and more well-educated. So all of a sudden you start to feel like, oh my gosh, everyone knows so much and like I'm still behind, how am I behind? Well, no, you've actually changed who you're comparing yourself to. If you compare where you were before you started learning about whatever and before you started doing it to where you are now is a huge difference. It's just you might have learned about some people who have been doing this for longer than you with the same intensity that you found yourself in. That and then is, you start to just, you know, nickel and diving and high, holding yourself to a higher standard. And all of a sudden you feel like you're not doing it, but you, you know, head and shoulders above where you were. Well, and your head and shoulders above 80, 20 rule is like, so you figure we're probably in all actuality, 80-20 rule means 80% of the people on Etsy are not really worried about it at all. So we're kind of going with the next 80-20. And if you're really interested in it and you're doing Marmalade and you're reading my blog and you're watching SEO videos, you're probably in the 20% of the 20%, right? You're really doing the work. If you're willing to pay for a tool that will help you sell more, um, and especially as a vintage, I think that the question I hear the most from the vintage people, because you guys tend to tag me or Tracy will tag me, when people say, well, should I pay for Marmalade? Is it worthwhile to pay for Marmalade when I'm vintage? Because, you know, I don't get these huge features. Oh my gosh, I could not imagine trying to sit there and figure out all the keywords I should be using. And if they're, you know, the little marmy meters, like I don't spend tons of time doing it, but if I see something that's like all red, I'm like, all right, I'm going to use my keywords more wisely by knowing that I just can't compete for this keyword with this one item. And 
it's just like there I just wouldn't do the job if if I had to rely on oh I'm gonna go search Etsy's drop down menu and then go look at other people's tags I just wouldn't like it's my it's my very fancy hobby but it's not you know I'm a marketing person so that's my job and I do this because it's so fun and it wouldn't be fun anymore if I had to do all that work so yes buy the marmalade <laughs> you don't care. pay me to say that. It's good advice. It is. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but it, but if there were doing like I have um, Longtail Pro, I pay for an SEO tool for Google. I have a website. I try to rank before I do it. You know, I there used to be free tools that you could use that went away. I mean, I think as any industry and as competition gets higher, you really start to distinguish yourself and how high you can go by some of the tools you can use. And I know a lot of your stuff, they can, if they want, they can sign up for free. And then if they want more advanced abilities, then that's where they have to pay. But to not use it would be crazy. Literally, every day I list, I use it. Like, there's just not a time. And so I was thinking... Does it sound cheesy? Well, I don't care if it sounds cheesy. Like, what am I going to do? I'm going to get my, I love eBay. You have like, I think it's 60 characters. So you type out like factually correct what it is. It is a gold metal spacer shaped like a palm leaf for an oil lamp, right? Like you're done. You're good. You can move on with your life. On Etsy, <laughs> I'd be like, uh, gold, bronze, let me think of all the synonyms. I'm just not that good at it. So I think that it does make it just thank you, Etsy, from that. You get so many more chances to rank for so many more keywords to be able to be found in so many more keyword search. In, uh, in Google, I think it's 170, isn't it? Like it's even less than Etsy. Yeah, I'm not sure offhand. I that think sounds it is. rough. I feel like it's between 61 and 70. Sounds right. Everything is also close now. Twitter, and then they're expanding with longer ones, and you got how many you can put in this title. I mean, everything's, I don't know. Everything's Very character changing. specific right now. Right? So we were talking about that. I was telling the, the guys that I had a couple of things that I wanted to tell you, and it's about being sad, and it's about things changing, and it's about always worrying about what you're not doing because I think as sellers we always like kind of beat ourselves up and we always think we're not doing enough and we always like we were saying compare ourselves to everybody else but but I just get so upset when I see people come on the marmalade board or the the vintage boards I come on and they're so frustrated and they're they're so unhappy and sad and they're like but I've been trying and I've been doing this and sometimes they have five items and they're like, I've been doing SEO as much as I could on these five items. Get more items. Like if you're a handmade seller, make more items. If you're a vintage seller, you can't compete in such a giant ocean with, you know, five boards in your boat. You're going to swamp. Um, the other thing that I see people doing is they, they swap horrible customer stories um, all the time. Like, it's as soon as somebody sends you sends them a, a message that they then go and they all pile on and then I see the girls or gentlemen or whoever spending the next two hours talking back and forth about a customer journey when they could be doing their work. I had a guy this week selling vintage is weird, right? So I had the cutest little shaker thing. It was orange and it had like this shape shaker top thing it was one of my favorites i took a couple of bucks off of it for the guy i sent it to him and he sent me an e a message and he's like this is half a tube of whatever the thing actually was i'm like i sold it as a decorative item and he went just absolutely nuts and i gave him his money back and he went away and i literally spent two minutes dealing with it and I wouldn't dream of going and posting that somewhere so we could all talk about him. And, and I got a four-star review. It was the most snarky four-star review you've ever seen. The seller handled this appropriately. Um, 
but but so so make sure you're spending your time if you have too few items seo them to the best of your ability and get more items if you have lots of items to list a lot of us vintage sellers have death piles and and rooms not that i have a room over there that has stuff in it that's not listed but but focus on the things that you can control you can control listing more you oh my gosh we are so lucky we don't have to renew all the time because we keep putting we can keep putting new things in the pipeline without having to generate new stuff just snap a few pictures do that so i, I, I do have a question yes the, did I hear that right, that you sold a decorative item and somebody bought it and tried to use the contents of the item? Yeah, it was um, it was old, uh, like, paste for, I don't like know. Paste. No, no. It was <laughs> That's what came to my mind originally. I'm like, <laughs> so someone just can't handle that new toothpaste. There's something in the old stuff. They just got to have. They've been searching this down. Hey, why is this only half full? <laughs> no, it was tire paste. I, he what? collects tire paste rolls. Tire there's, paste. There's somebody for every one of your items out there. There's somebody sitting at home hoping desperately that you list your flamingo box so that they can buy it. Right? You just have, And with vintage, that's something that we hardly ever talk about. Um, I listen to the most amazing podcast. It's called Scavenger Life um, for vintage people. They only do eBay. So they're very like, I don't care for eBay as well as Etsy. I feel it's more garage sale and then I put all my good stuff on Etsy. But the people on there are just the neatest people. And they're very much in the list it and forget it. So I have 400 items. 460 some items I'm trying to get to 500 but people keep buying them and so I don't worry every day about is this one or these couple items selling I'm worrying about can I get enough volume in there so that when somebody is looking for a brass cow on a stick that that I have one up to sell for them I mean it's 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 very cute. It's an item that you would want if you had a cow kitchen, if you were a decorator and doing things. But it's not going to be every day that somebody's looking for a cow on a stick. So that's just the kind of thing that you have to understand when you sell a unique one-of-a-kind item. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And like you were saying, as far as like filling up a store... You wouldn't go to like a craft fair or something like that and get a table and put just like one item on there because people would walk by, they'd look and then say, oh, OK, and just keep going. But if you have a bunch of things, they might look at some stuff. They might go back and look at this. And hey, if they stand around there long enough, they might have time to think like, you know, I actually do like that thing. I'll take it home. Yeah, I think that that from what I've seen, if I had to pick, like I said, I look at lots of stores. I look at lots of stuff. I would say the new kids' um, biggest problem is they just don't have enough stuff for sale, right? They just, whether it's handmade, one-of-a-kind, vintage, craft supplies, like you go to their store and you can tell that they very sincerely put effort into it and, uh, and, and there's, there's five things. And you're like, there, there's just psychological things that go on with it. My husband hates that I do marketing tests. He's a computer programmer, and so he works in algorithms all day. And I did on my website, if you do a search for how many items should you have in an Etsy store, I did a um, super non-scientific. Like, so I looked at, you know, 20 stores that had these kind of things and 20 stores that... And he's like, that is not real data. And I'm like, I totally know that, but I looked at a whole bunch of stores. <laughs> And come to find out, if you take out the Chinese, you know, like 20,000 stores, because they really, I know you're not supposed to do that either, but if you take them out, because they really messed up the numbers, it was about 155. If you can get to about 100, I think it's 155. If you can get to about 155 items in your store, you could see that they were getting consistent sales, that they were doing that kind of stuff. And I've heard people say a hundred. 
if you have five items, shoot for 20. If you have 20, shoot for 50. And then if your pictures are bad, then take back, like you have to learn to take better pictures. And there's just, I don't know how many people you've had come on that talk about pictures, but if you are not taking good pictures, they don't have any other way of seeing your items. So if your whites aren't white, then go to photo fuse and take the backgrounds off. If you, um, if you can only take pictures, you know, in at night because you have a job, then get a light box or you have to figure out your pictures. That so it would be not enough items, pictures, and then this may shock you. I think the next biggest problem is they're they're pricing their products too low. So um, I I was doing an in person event. And there was a lady, her name is Mary, she comes to all my things, and she was selling this really beautiful handmade doll, like a Raggedy Ann doll, and it had clothing, so it had like a dress and, and underdress stuff, and it had a bonnet, and then she said she did an embroidery in the grandmother's handwriting, so the grandmother would write the child's name and she would scan it, oh, wow. and then she she would embroider it on there yeah and caught and it all handmade the cost for the doll was forty dollars and the embroidery was five and she i just was must like, really love embroidering things dude i guess but i was <laughs> like if somebody is looking for an heirloom for their child oh yeah yeah they see it's forty dollars they are going to assume there's something wrong with it right if you charge $240 and it's $50 to get the embroidery then they're going to be like because her pieces were beautiful mm -hmm. right um if if I'm selling a and, and you'll see this in vintage you'll do a search to kind of compare to try to get your prices yeah. and I'm selling that lamp that is antique it's a converted oil lamp and I'm mocking but it has a heavy marble base it has lion's claws feet in the metal. If I were selling that for $50, people would assume there's something wrong with it. If I'm selling it for $250, I'm selling it to somebody who knows they need to restore it, have it rewired. It's like $60 to ship it. They're not going to be fussing at me about the cost of the shipping. And you just get yourself into a whole different level of customer if you price your products correctly. So those would be my three things just in general that I think people are having a bother with. Yeah, that's solid. Take You gotta think the, take the thought out of that stuff. If the pictures aren't good, you're making people think about, you know, what's not being shown. Like, no. especially eBay. You mentioned eBay a couple of times. Man, like, the thing with eBay was always, if you're not showing, like, that one angle or that one corner, what's going on there? You know? There's scratch. What's burning here? The thing you're not showing me is, is something there is broken. And the pricing again, like if, if something seems too good to be true, our first instinct is it's too good to be true. And, and if there's other, yeah, if there's other options. I'm just going to go to it because I don't want to take that risk. Well, and you're not going to take your time to like. I get lots of questions about my stuff because it's expensive, right? So yeah. they're like. Okay, now this razor blade, is it in good shape? And then I'll send them some more. On this marble ashtray, what is this? They're not asking me questions about my price. They've already said, oh, it's a $50 ashtray or it's a $300 lamp or whatever. Now they're just trying to say, is this the correct solution for my problem? Not, oh, yeah. what's the matter with that thing? Right. Yeah, it's a totally it's a great different way to look at it. And it also makes those questions a lot more worthwhile for you to answer then, too. Right? Yeah. yeah. So it's very fun. And I know that with you guys, you get all the SEO questions and that, that like, that it's so cute. When people get mad about Etsy SEO, I'm like, oh, my gosh have been doing Google SEO since 2001. 
16 years. Do you know what's happened in 16 years? They you don't mean it's not the same? Wait, they yeah, don't wait, I thought it was the same. <laughs> oh, it's just the same. Like, they weren't even around in... Well, I guess they were, but they weren't doing it. We're doing That's like no the same as web crawler, right? Yeah. Web crawler and log file. Yeah. <laughs> Rock <in> the aperture. <laughs> That's just some nerdy SEO talk for you guys. <laughs> Gonna be Googling web crawler. <laughs> right? It was a good one. I don't know. I wonder what pops up at that point. Yeah, I don't even know where that goes now. I think I used to use one called Metacrawler, which supposedly searched multiple search engines. Well, the dog pile. There is still a webcrawler.com. Is there? What's there? A uh, little spider icon with the magnifying glass, which I think is the same, but it's been <laughs> so long. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. But, oh, but it I, looks like. There you go. It looks like 19. Looks the same. Like 2001. <laughs> that one is the same. That's the same since 2001. That one hasn't changed. <laughs> but I think that's super frustrating for people. They think that Etsy is just, you know, out to get them with changing the SEO or making us do the attributes. Nobody yeah. likes to do the attributes, but if they're going to be doing searches, ba like if they're going to be sorting searches based on attributes, I am happy to do attributes. Sure. So just, just, it's fine. If you have 467 listings and they're going to keep yelling at you in your, your um, listing manager, you know how when the attributes came out, they just like, they were in your face. They're like, you got to do your attributes. You got So I did them on there. There's other things that, that I know could, I could massage, I could do things with. Functionally, what I'll do is I may go into some of the big items. The, like I'll put a cutoff. I'll say over $100 or over $200. I'll go fix all those guys. But if it's, you know, if it's under $100 and there's something that really could revolutionize them, I'm just going to go the ones going forward. So I think pick your battles because um, it's going to change. Like whatever we said today is going to be different tomorrow. And you just got to kind of try to keep up. Oh, that's another thing. So look at the dates of SEO posts or um, how to do Etsy posts. Because, like, on my post, what I'll do, I have blog posts that are still popular from 2010. And I'll go in and I'll say updated October 2017. Or, you know, just make sure that the, the information that you're using for your resources is current. Makes sense. There you go. Everything's current. That's one of the things I look for online, too, whenever I'm doing whatever, is to make sure that, like, has this thing been updated in a while? Sometimes you come across yeah. website, it's been like, you know, you can't find anything new since like 2014. You wonder if the business is still around. <laughs> I find that with local businesses a lot. You know, you'll be looking up something and, be, and they're posting a bunch of stuff and all of a sudden it stops. And it was like three years ago and it's like, I'm going to call them and see if anybody answers the phone before I drive out there because I'm not sure if they're still there. Yeah. Well, Google Maps <laughs> thinks they're still there, but I don't know. <laughs> but that's a reason to keep fresh, right? That works with yes. that that just works with everything. If you are if you are not continually working on your stuff, and so I mean I'm totally guilty of this. I haven't added anything new to my digital one. I think I added one over the summer and my sales are going down. And I can tell you exactly why my sales are going down because I can hit refresh on those same fifty some listings over and over and over again but Etsy wants to know that I'm still interested in my site and that's the one big advantage we have I mean even if you're just going and buying a few tchotchkes at you know the yard sale up the street or you're picking up some of your cool stuff add something into your store yeah. consistently yeah. if it's weekly that's fine if it's daily that's fine I tend to be really hard like Today's a really hard day for me to do um, listing because I have Blog Monday where I do uh, work for clients. And then I usually have an interview or something this afternoon. Then my son has, it's my day to take him to football. So I know I can't list. 
So um, yesterday I did a few extra listings and I'll just publish them when we get off. So it's generally pretty easy as a vintage seller to continue to list. Mm -hmm. Finding stuff is not a problem. There's a lot of stuff. I like it. It's a good. It tip. helps to have what a, somewhat of like a cadence, and you know, if you have a routine, I think it makes everything a lot easier too. You know, um, my guess is, you know, based on what you described, like your routine probably helps you stay on track a lot. You know, you have these goals, like I want to. You mentioned you're trying to hit like 500 items, but people, you know, darn them, they keep buying all your stuff. You know, it makes it hard to hit that number. And you have an idea of like what days you can and can't do things. And, but you seem to have like a momentum with it, which I'm sure helps a ton. Oh, it does. And it just makes it easier. I notice. And if you ever stop listing for a little bit, um, we had at the end of end of the summer when the kids were like, we were packing everything into the last two weeks. Cause I'm like, they're going back. I should do something with them. Um, mother of the year. Uh, so I didn't list for like two weeks. I gave myself permission. It was like my summer vacation. And man, it was a slog getting back into doing it. But when you're just doing it all the time and you have your pictures taken or, you ha or you're like, oh, Tuesday's picture day. So almost every Tuesday I'll go in and I'll take just a bunch of pictures. And, um, you know, it's just it's it's easy if you have a day that you do stuff. And I tend to, I've learned long time ago, I, I do a lot of work with time management. That's what some of my forms are. And it's called time blocking. So instead of saying, um, I got done with my work from today. And instead of saying, oh, I'm going to try to list a few things and change gears and do Etsy. I yeah. just listened, I listened to a podcast that I'd been meaning to listen to between the time I got done with my work and this, because that isn't productive time. Trying to get off of this and my daughter's going to be coming home and I have 15 minutes. I know that there are people that can squeeze. You could squeeze in social media, right? Yeah. Like I could go check Facebook. I could do something like that. But to do something where you really are trying to think about your SEO, you're trying to get your keywords right. You're trying to make everything better. That yeah. wouldn't be that. That it just isn't what I would do. So if you can time block your time and know which days you're doing stuff, you can you can do so much better. It's amazing how little time I have for the things that are good for me and how hard it is to like, if I take a break from them to start doing them again, but the things that necessarily aren't good for me, but like I just do anyway, so much time for them. No, <laughs> so much time. <laughs> but you make time for that. Like, right. You can always yes. find time to play that little turtle game on your phone. Um, but for me, you know, social media isn't my favorite, but if you, if you say, okay, every time you, if you want to go out with the dogs and sit outside, you can't play on the little turtle game. You have to check your Facebook. I would gain 15, you know, I would gain at least a half an hour a day on Facebook. Yeah. Which could, trade off. Yep, which could mean that I would make more money, or it could just mean that I would go slowly insane faster. <laughs> <laughs> Either one. <laughs> we don't well, know. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm really big on, but I know my goals very, very specifically. Um, I tend to work in three month increments. So this is my last, you know, this is my last three months. I'm not selling anymore, and I didn't last year either. Um, October wasn't like, it was my first year as a vintage seller, like my first real holiday season. I was like, oh my gosh, it's October. They're going to go crazy, and I'm going to, and and it slowly ramped up. November was really good for me, um, the mm -hmm. first part of December. And then I sell planners on my other store, so that was really nice at the end of December. But I know not to um, to really try to do anything big or interesting this quarter of the year because if I if I want to have a really nice holiday for my kids and I want to have my house decorated and I want to be able to ship out all my stuff, then that's what's going to be important. I'm starting a fun little personal blog, but I'm not going to start something that is really going to impact my business. 
Now, come January, I'm going to say, okay, if I wanted to do, let's say, a new email autoresponder or something like that, then I would push that off. So it's really knowing your priorities. And that's one of the very coolest things about being an Etsy seller. If you know you get swamped at the holidays and everybody's telling you to change your keywords, don't change your keywords. You're going to sell plenty without doing all that work. And you're using time that you could be creating you know, so you really have to know your own business. And sometimes advice that we get doesn't really work for our own particular circumstance. Yeah, we definitely see a lot of times where sellers will take advice from other sellers on something that worked well in their shop. And it's kind of like you can't you can't always just assume that because something worked for somebody else, it's going to have the same success for you. Yeah, maybe their pictures are amazing. Like they did this thing. And their husband's a photographer, they're a photographer. So no matter what they did, they would have been like featured on the Etsy, you know, newsletter or yeah. BuzzFeed would have picked them up. Well, if you don't happen to have that one skill that was the actual thing that worked, then yeah, you can wind up chasing your tail a lot. So, you know, that that's the thing. It's so fun to sell on Etsy. I have such a great time. I just think it's the funnest thing. And it is. It's my hobby. And, and I get to go in dusty houses and, and look at dead people's stuff, which is awesome. But but at the end of the day, it's it's it really should fit in your life. And I understand completely. If this is your income, then you do have to be very sincere and, and do everything you can. Just make sure. We were talking earlier about teams. Like if you're on a team and you're spending your days liking other Etsy sellers products and, and you're doing that, that may not be the best use of your time because Etsy sellers may not be the purchasers of what you're selling. And I think with vintage people, we're even more so like that. Like we may buy some of the other people's stuff, but in actuality, there's so much inexpensive stuff available that it would be like I would buy something maybe for myself personally, but I can't source products to sell on Etsy from Etsy. Right. Um, so just really look at where your time is going. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Get in front of your buyers, not necessarily sellers, time management. Make sure you, you know, I'm a big believer in what you focus on expands. I agree 100%. Use your marmalade. Yep. Absolutely. If in doubt. If go in doubt, use marmalade. <laughs> That's right. Well, I love talking to you guys. You're awesome. Thanks. Well, thanks. We love talking to you too, Tara. It's fantastic. Thanks for coming back again. Yay. Always a great time. Yeah. If they have, if they have any questions, probably the... Um, so first off, they can email me, Tara, at Marketing Artfully. Mm -hmm. Um. But if they have any questions, and, and I think you let them in even if they don't use marmalade, right? Into your Facebook group? Or oh, yeah. they have to? Oh, good. No, nope, you don't have to be that? a customer. Okay. Just um, a but, legitimate Etsy seller. <laughs> there right. you go. Um, but, With SEO questions, not yes. everything else. <laughs> yeah. So it's really focused on SEO. So if you were listening to this or watching this and you have SEO questions, Make sure you join the Marmalade group because I'm there. Um, I answer when I can. There's like the, the quality of people and the quality of education that the people have there about Etsy SEO is really high. And everybody talks to everybody and they're really um, happy to help you figure stuff out. Thanks. Yeah, that means a lot. We, we really enjoy our Facebook group. That means a lot that you say that. Good group. Yeah, it is a good group. Yay. Uh, this was fantastic, Tara. Anyone who is wanting to kind of catch more of the tips that Tara shared earlier in the episode, um, they're pretty much straight from her blog post that she put together. Obviously, she covered a bunch of other things, too. But if you want a good refresher on those things, uh, make sure you go to marketingartfully.com slash vintage SEO. Uh, I just tried it, and it worked, just like she said it would. Uh, it takes you right to that <laughs> blog post when it's really cool. It's a, uh, it's a nice long post and there's a lot of good information there for vintage sellers, um, who maybe have been struggling a little bit with how to do your SEO. Excellent. So, yeah. 
So thanks again. And we'll have to chat with you another time. Okay. <laughs> another time, another topic. <laughs> exactly. And then for everyone else, we will catch you guys next time on Etsy Jam. <laughs>